so we're talking about independent, right? So the whole idea is of what brings you where and how you get there. So we're going to start with Alex. Um, so let's say you have a job at a major studio. Why do you leave? So for me, it's really important to maintain my relationships at major studios because it's, it's best to work within the major studios, but to have autonomy so that I can choose where to mix with my clients and what things are going to, um, what things are better suited for, for which facility. And, um, if you are at just one facility, you don't, you don't get to make those choices. So Jeff, your history has been littered with working in different kinds of styles. You've been live, you've been recording, and then you went into the post world. Now that you're independent, what setbacks do you see from going independent? What is the hard part about it? The hard part is doing everything, right? <laughs> I mean, to be honest, um, you know, it's, um, we're the salespeople, we're the, you know, that, at times we're the janitor, you know, um, there's a lot of stuff that goes involved. You know, I'm the sound designer, I'm the mixer, I'm the Foley artist at times, you know, so the bank, the bank you know, the, <laughs> thank you. Um, so clearly that was Jeff's <laughs> wife that said the bank. <laughs> um, so for everyone, what do you think has changed over the past five to 10 years that makes independent contracting so much more appealing? Alex, do you want to? jump in? Yeah, sure. So, um, a lot of, a lot of places are, um, well, a lot of clients are working remotely now. So, so location is not so much, uh, as important as it used to be, but it's important to have a workflow that you can, you can offer your clients that, that, you know, you can trust to be able to cast to them. And, um, being independent is a nice way to be part of the earlier conversations about how you're going to tackle a project um, from start to finish. And you're involved in the conversations about, um, you know, the, the logistics of it, also the financials of it, like how you're going to spend your budget. And if you're independent, you're brought into those conversations early as you're starting to figure out where you're going to do the project. Um, whereas if you work at a, at a studio or a company, usually that's all worked out by the time you get offered that job. Rephrase. Um, no, but so what's changed in the past five, 10 years that um, makes being independent contractor more appealing? Because you've come from the production side of it. Yeah, I come from a different perspective. I'm not an audio person. I am head of post-production. So going independent and partnering with my husband, opening our own facility, um, which was a natural progression for us. Um, I come at it from a client perspective. So for me, watching the talent, i.e. the mixers, the colorists, the editors, I watched a demise in their creativity because I think they've been a little bit stifled by the corporate structure. Like if you need a plugin, it's two months of waiting for it to go up to finance to get it into your computer. So I think there's a lot of benefits. And then I concur with Alex about remote. Remote has changed everything. So to continue with you, <laughs> because I'm going to have to, why RAR? Why did you, what is exactly why you wanted to do that thing, right? Not being in on the, as you called it, talent side. So from a client perspective, I've been doing this for 20 years and sitting in the room, I have seen the talents be compromised, overworked, underpaid. They're not passionate about my project anymore. I have seen myself and the production companies getting nickeled and dimed. It's all about the corporate profits, the overheads, all of that, and less about me and my showrunner, whose project is the most important thing he's ever done. And this is the greatest thing he's going to do all year. And they're not on the same team. So for us, I think we wanted to get away from that, be more boutique, be more about nurturing our talent and nurturing the client, making sure that they have everything that they need. And uh, kind of filling that void that has been growing, you know, rapidly over the last 10 years. Yeah. And that's not to say working at a big studio is bad. <laughs> Please. Thank you very much for letting us be here. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, well, but because Alex is a completely different situation, right? Because you're still working in the, the big studios. 
but you've just found that it's just a completely different set of circumstances, but still independent, right? Yeah, for like I actually very much like working here at Sony. I think the culture here is really great. Um, but I also like having the opportunity to work at a different studio if I would like to, or if my client doesn't want to come to this location or whatever the case might be. It's really nice to be able to have flexibility because, and and also I think that when you work at one place, so I'm I'm. Independent, but not really, because I'm a contractor still. I get contracted through, I'll get contracted through Sony or through any major studio. Um, but I think what's important is that there are more questions involved when approaching me because because I am independent. People don't know my schedule already. They have to call me to find out what my schedule is, my availability, and that gives me a little bit more flexibility to make a choice about whether or not this project sounds like the right fit for me or if it's going to be the right thing um, time-wise or if it looks like it's going to push into something that I really do want to do. I get to make those decisions where as uh, when you work at one place, they they know your overall um, picture. And so there's usually less decision, like less autonomy to make those decisions for yourself. So again, focus right. I'm going to talk about technology. <laughs> Clearly, you guys don't seem to be having any issues with having moved. <laughs> you know, I mean, just because obviously these are gorgeous places to work, right? But it's clear you don't have to necessarily have, I didn't see the ceiling. That is really pretty. Can you do that, Jeff? Uh, <laughs> On it. <laughs> Phase two. Phase two. But obviously the technology is not getting in the way now, right? No, it's uh, it's uh, it's actually, you know, the golden age, right? <laughs> um, at home, I have an Atmos Bay at home and I have an Atmos Bay at work now, you know, and it's seamlessly the exact same setup. Um you know, and every room in our facility is all Dante connected via focus, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's really opened up the doors for us. I, you know, we're really excited about it. And yeah. So Alex, same thing to you. I mean, you don't see any issues, right? Because you're bouncing around from the big places, but you also do work at home. I do. Yeah. I'll pre-dub at home. I built a home studio a couple of years ago. I just moved. So I've, I'm now rebuilding that studio, but I, I did um, take a pre-dub from that studio to uh, deluxe and I was really happy with the way that it translated. And yeah, we use Focusrite at the big places and at my garage. <laughs> you can see how this is going, right? <laughs> um. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions so far? I feel like we're flying because I just had a bunch of coffee. So <laughs> what? I definitely have a question. I, I want to know, so I'm independent. Uh, so right now I'm in this place of trying to figure out how to scale or how to take, how to, how to say no to less people. And uh, that's just been a struggle for me this last you know, year and a half or so. Curious if you have any. Yes, yeah, you should just sit down and have coffee with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, scaling is a big problem. <laughs> when we open the doors, because I mean, this uh, RAR was born out of the pandemic. I mean, the work kept coming. It was busier than it's ever been. We're in the dock and reality world. So like the turnover is very fast for us. And as the pandemic winded down, we realized like people wanted to come in this whole remote viewing that was like, it's no, we're done. I need to be in the bay. So we decided to open a facility. And when we did that, the paint had barely dried and we went from four shows to 14. So scaling is really complicated at first. But for us, we continue to use independent contractors rather than continuing with the overhead of having you know, one, two mixers that are on staff and trying to throw everything at them. That's, again, the burnout, right? So, um, yeah, scaling is really interesting. I don't know if you want to touch on that. Yeah, I mean, finding talent, right? <laughs> it's, you know, finding reliable talent is hard. Um, and we've, you know, navigated that Alex. on our end. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Alex, what are you doing later? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, but it's as as we've grown, we've kind of learned that uh, you know you, you find the people and you hold on to the good ones and you got to ditch the bad ones quick, right? And you got to be able to pivot really fast on that, you know, as the client will, you know, it'll fall upon you to to deal with them, you know. But as everyone says, it's a good problem to have having to say no. Yeah. Right. 
But then how do you say no? Because maybe the next big project is coming from that client, right? That to me is always the, 100%. you know, the, the, oh, this one's really low budget. They're a pain in the ass. I got to get rid of this show. And, you know, the next one comes in and, you know, it's all the things you want. So you got to dance that jig, if you will. But luckily with the technology, I mean, if you can find talent that that shares your vision for your company or or, you know, audio, whatever it is that you're working on, if you can find them, hold on to them, pay them well, you know, don't undercut them. Um, and they'll stick with you for a long time. And, and then you can continue to build your roster so that you can take on those projects and you can profit from the from the overhead. Do you have quick follow up? Sorry. <laughs> That's OK. Do you have uh, independent contractors? Thank you. Hello. Hi. Do you have uh, contractors that are remote or are, are most of your contractors in your facility? Uh, sometimes it depends on the on the content. Obviously, um, some some content is a, a, a little, is allowed to leave the facility, and some isn't. So sure, um, that's kind of how we base that. You know, depending on the basically the security protocols. Cool. Yeah. Cool. But Thank the you. remote technology. I mean, you if you have the security protocols and the clearance to do so, you could have a hundred shows going on at once all over town. Yeah. And they only need to be in when the client's in. Right. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Chuck it. Just toss it. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Just pass it back. Yeah. Uh, hi. Just based on what I've seen um, here today, and and myself being new to the city. But I also see there's a lot of students, there's a lot of younger people who are just getting started in their careers, and this might be something really interesting for them. How would they build a business? You obviously have started with a lot of really great connections and contacts and been in the studio industry. For someone who's coming from outside and is just coming up as, a, as someone who's either moved here from somewhere else or is just getting started in their career after, out of school and everything, what would you suggest that they do? I want Alex to talk about this first. Mm, me, yeah, too. me too. <laughs> um, well, like well, like you were saying, a lot of my clients that have stuck with me the longest are the ones that didn't pay me anything in the beginning. A lot of uh, clients I did short films for years ago when I was still checking um, have developed in their own careers as well and have become directors of feature films of things that I am proud to work on. Um, so I, I would say that it's hard, this is a hard question for me to answer because I am not trying to promote the hustle culture, culture that I came up in, but I, I took every opportunity I could. I worked after hours. I was a tech and then at night I would sound design. I did, um, I did a lot of mixing. I did a lot of ghost mixing for my, my mixer when I was a tech. I, um, took everything and anything I could get my hands on just to meet people, to meet producers, to um, show my edits to a supervisor. I would cut stuff on the stage just to show them. Uh, hopefully they wanted to listen after we wrapped. I would recut a scene that we were already mixing just just for fun, just just to show that I had the the capability to edit. Um, and I would, I would also try to, you know, commandeer people to come listen to my mixes as well. So I just, I think the best thing to do is to show as many people as you can your work. I mean, that kind of goes with everything, right? Mm -hmm. Is show up. Yeah. yeah. You know, and yeah. that just seems to make sense. Did you have anything to add? I mean, that, it all sounds so right. I mean, yeah, the same thing for me, I, I, you know, when I'd look back upon it, it was literally whatever I had to do 16 hours a day, every day, seven days a week for my 20s, most of my 30s, you know, until it all started, of your 40s, all of my 40s, now. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, and that's that was the dedication. That's what it is, because to be honest, there's. 20 other guys behind you wanting it just as bad. So you got to hustle. You got to be there and you got to present good work number one and number two you got to be super personable with the clients that you know those are the relationships you're building those and like Alex some of my clients go back 20 years that have been you know and they're they're now my biggest clients you know so you got to keep that relationship going you got to have a strong work ethic i.e the hustle and then you've got to show up with your own work for me personally as a head of post anyone that I've ever promoted has always come to me. Is there anything I can do to help? I want to get my feet. What you got to? They got to put themselves out there. So if you're doing an assist job and you thought it was going to be prelay, 
but you're really just getting coffee and donuts. Well, go get the coffee and the donuts, put a smile on your face, and then continue to ask, can I help? I do have one thing to add, actually, which is to be kind to everybody because people really move up in this industry in extraordinary ways where you'll meet somebody who is a, you know, post supervisor or coordinator, and then you'll see them five years later and they're now an executive producer. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to, to get to know people, to know what their interests are, if they're going to maybe branch off and become a director to let them know that, Hey, if you, if you do direct that project that you're talking about, I'd be down to help you with it. Um, just and, and also make sure that you that people know what you want to do as well. Which makes sense too, because whether it is being in a big studio or being independent, just be nice to people. Yeah. Right? Be kind, be personable. This is everything in life. Uh, anything else? Any questions? This is easy. How much money do you need to get going? Uh, see, that was, that was going to be the last well. question. We were going to talk about the money thing if we ran out of time, but I'm glad somebody else said it. Yeah. Jeff, tell us your pain. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> how, I, how right do you want to do it? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I again, my background started in music once upon a time. I was a live sound engineer, and then I moved into, you know, producing records and whatnot and owning studios along the way. Um which was a costly game, especially back within the days of outboard gear. Um, so you just kind of have to grow it, um, take a budget and look at, you know, what, I don't know what avenue you want to, you're looking at, but for us it was every step of the way is, okay, this is going to cost this. And then it would be like, but to do it right, it's going to cost this. And so yeah. to me, it's do it right. Do it right the first time, you'll see the return, hopefully, um, <laughs> through it all. On on us, we're the bank. We 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 own ourselves out completely. Yeah, we down. personally fund it. I, I'm I don't know if you guys know Dave Ramsey, but I like literally live by like I refuse to be in debt motto. Um, I still have a car loan. Don't judge me. <laughs> um, but I didn't want to go in in debt. This was a a gamble, as is any business that's starting out. And like I said, we're lucky that we're having to scale so quickly, but that could change. In spring, we could have no work. It could dry up, you know, who knows? So what I didn't want to do is take a risk of losing, you know, more than what I put in. So we saved up and saved up and saved up for a pool, which I don't have now. (laughs) You sound so happy about that. Sometimes I show up to work in my bathing suit. Um, do you guys have any external support on your team, like, you know, publicist, agent, anybody else on your team aside from you, or are you guys handling everything on your own? I built our website. <laughs> I did pretty good. I'm pretty proud of it, but it could use some help. It's fine. Um, I just started our Instagram. It has all four posts. Here's where we're having an issue is that we're stretched is because we're so new. We don't have someone sitting in my position 100%. I'm still director of post for another production company. All of their shows finish at RAR. (laughs) So that works out great. Um, But I don't have 100% time in that chair. He deals with all of the clients because they keep coming because of the relationship he has with them. So he's not only mixing their shows, but he's fielding the phone calls and, and sending me the budgets to get the bids together. So, you know, will we have that? Yes. We do have IT, though. <laughs> I will yeah, say so that. We have a great engineer. We have a great engineer, and I highly recommend if you wanted to have a post house, Please don't do it without an engineer. <laughs> so, Alex, how about you, though? I mean, do you have someone out helping hunt for things, or is it just you've made great relationships and it's, you're expanding on those? A lot of it is relationships, but I have had some help in the past. I mean, some 
some projects still come to me from a salesperson or somebody who uh, has been asked. They have a relationship like a head of a, of a studio or like like Kim Jimenez here might have a client who's looking for somebody to work with. And she would think that I'm a good fit for that particular client because she has the relationship with them. So um, sometimes that that happens as well. So that goes back to um, having relationships with different studios and um, and as far as publicity goes, I don't I. I have once hired a publicist um, because I was uh, nominated for an Emmy, which was a new experience for me. And I didn't know if that was, um, I know I'm not trying to <laughs> brag about that, but I didn't know what to do. So I, it's, um, <laughs> it's braggable. <laughs> You're allowed to. <laughs> so uh, a publicist hit me up and I was oh, okay, I'll, I'll try that out. I think that it was really fun and it was cool to be able to like share my craft. And I had more opportunities to be interviewed by, you know, like these smaller publications and stuff. So that was really fun. Do I think that it helped me in a career sense, like getting jobs, like in a practical manner? Probably, probably not. But um, if I were like a studio, if I had built my own studio, I think that that would be something I'd be after is getting my name out there with a publicist. So I'm going to pause the questions just for one second, if I may. When we were going to talk about money, because that's what we do, we work for money. Um, I'm sure it is quite different for both of you, because as you touched upon, opening a studio isn't cheap. It's pool worthy, apparently. So I am assuming, yeah, I'm assuming that uh, part of independence is money, but also not. Do you want to, Alex, do you want to start with that? Or do you, you want to defer? Just because it's one of those things of, that's probably a big part of what people are thinking, right? So do you see that you feel that you're making more than you were because you're being able to be more choosy or because you can set rates or, I mean, what um, do we think? Yeah. I mean, with, with us as independent contractors, re-recording mixers, like my, my position in this is not uh, rare. A lot of us are, are contracted. And so, yeah, I do think that you have a little bit more flexibility again to like renegotiate a rate depending on what the project is when they when they call you to do that project, especially if you're bouncing around town. My rate changes per project. It's um, it just depends on the budget and also how much I want to work on it. If it's something I really, really want to work on, but they don't I know for a fact that their budget is X then um, I will negotiate a rate that makes sense for me and makes sense for the studio that I'm working at. Um, I think independent, I, I mean, it took me a long time to get to this place. I, I did, um, you know, I worked at Tadeo, if anybody remembers that company, sadly. <laughs> I, I worked there for nine years, and I meet people today that don't know that company name, which is really sad to me, so that's why I had to check. <laughs> but um, I worked there for a long time, and at that time, I was really happy to be employed by, a, you know, a well-known, reputable studio because they did feed me a lot of work. And at that time, it, it you know, I, I was always booked, and I felt really comfortable that I had like a base, at least I could like expect a certain amount of money. If I were to go completely independent at that point in my career, I definitely would have taken a hit. Um, now I don't like at this point in my career, it's, it's kind of, I'm making the same. And if anything, I'm just taking a little bit less work. Cause I've, I've, I've now woken up and realized that I worked through most of my twenties and thirties without even thinking about it. So, um, I'm, I'm making, uh, I'm able to negotiate a higher rate and also able to take less work if I want to, which is a great, it feels really nice. <laughs> and I think Jeff, earlier today, you made a mention that Melrose Mac loves you now. You buy a computer a week. Every to scale. day, almost every day I seem to be going in there. Uh, again, the, as I said earlier, the punch card, I'm due for one. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, for us, it's, yeah, I guess you could say we're, we're making more money, right? Obviously, we're seeing all of that budget, but then what that, you know, actually turns out to be once you, you know, you pay all the staff and all, you know, and again, buying the computer every day. Um, you know, we're still learning, but it, yes, it's, it's better. <laughs> okay, did we, there's one there. My name is also Alex. 
And um, my wife and I uh, built a music studio uh, about a year ago. We made an investment because we saw the future of music to be shifted over to spatial audio and Atmos, and it has, which is amazing. And uh, for us, it's been part of the hustle has been that, which is like creating YouTube videos, uh, doing partnerships with brands, software companies, doing all that stuff, being on Instagram, obviously, doing posts and things like that, building a website <laughs> that's functional and that people place orders and all that stuff. And so what I've learned is, um, number one, going Atmos was one of the best decisions we made because it allowed us an open door for labels. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're still seeing that there is, um, I guess the question is on the clients, like how do you break through uh, larger clients um, in the midst of, you know, sending cold call emails and things like that? Like, is, do you have any recommendations or advice on breaking in the, I know this is more TV and film, but like breaking into the music industry with more labels or more label work. Um, yeah, I'll <laughs> jump in a little bit. It's just all relationships. It is. You know, um, if you know the person who knows the person who knows the person, you got to get somewhere and you got to just meet as many people as possible. Right. And this is, I mean, it sounds like that's what it is for everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. It's that whole thing of you treat everyone amazing they're going to go, oh, look, it's Alex. I love Alex. You should talk to Alex. You know what I mean? And it's a slog. Um, well, so when Jeff alluded to having a recording studio, that's how we met. I had a recording studio in the same block of buildings. So I've known Jeff. I've seen Jeff go from crusty to this. Somewhat um, crusty. <laughs> somewhat, somewhat crusty. Clean crusty. Slightly less crusty. <laughs> But it's, it's, there's always that evolution, right? And the whole time, it's you are kind, and you, you always show that. And then you have people go, oh, you should talk to this person. You know? And especially in, in Los Angeles, it is, I'm the person who introduced this person to this person, and now look at them. You know what I mean? So to and, me... And get out to the events like this, or you know, any of this, you know, go to NRG or wherever you got to go to any of their little um, parties. We were just talking about that earlier. Uh, um, you know, you got to get out in front of people. That's that's how you do it. And uh, you know, it was a little hard in the last few years, obviously, because we've all been stuck in our houses. Um, so, you know, I think how you do that nowadays, I guess, is Instagram too, and you know, social media. I think you can start plugging people and just yeah. promoting that way. I found my stage tech that works with us on the stage through Instagram, actually. She first she first hit me up on Instagram, and I kind of, you know, didn't think it was very professional at first, to be honest. And so I, I'd let sit there, and then I ended up looking at her uh, her page or whatever you call it, her handle. <laughs> and I saw that she was very interested in sound. She had all kinds of posts about, you know, sound. She had been editing as a, uh, an interactive, so she'd been editing dialogue. So I invited her to the stage and she, uh, I taught her about, <laughs> about the interface, about, um, I was trying to teach her the ins and outs, uh, and the different uh, way that we, you know, I was basically trying to scare her, to be honest, to see how she reacted to that. Um, because though, I knew right? <laughs> that's huge. You need to know what this is really like. No, go on. Yeah. Yeah. So I showed her the Dante and, you know, I, I looked at her reaction and she was just right there writing everything down. And I'm like, she's, she's going to be great. And I had a conversation with her. She was extremely, extremely bright and ready to go. And she's been like amazing to work with. And now Again, like now when I get hit up for projects that I don't have time for or that are, you know, beginning filmmakers, I've been passing them to her and she's now staying after and mixing those and, you know, following in the same in the same way that I've done. And uh, it all came from Instagram. And can we say don't be shy? Nobody wants shy anymore because that vo the shy voice is the voice that you don't hear because there's a loud voice right over here. You were saying there's 20 people behind you, and that's when you're working full time. You know what I mean? The people who aren't working full time, there's 150 people behind you. We've been lucky. Most people have paid on time, if not within 30 days overdue. Do we have a client right now that's really upsetting me? Yes. We received a promo from them. And a simple email saying, yeah, I'm not going to mix it and color it until you pay. 
And now we've gotten a deposit. So, I mean, it, it, will we have to go to collections? Oh, I guarantee it. There will be somebody. I chased somebody for six months for $1,000. It was Jeff. <laughs> it, was- <laughs> it was me. <laughs> I still haven't got it. Still I'm, just kidding. I'm kidding. No, we got it. We finally got it. <laughs> she gets all the money. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a tough position because I, I don't like being the bad guy. I, I really don't. But uh, sometimes if you want to be in this business, you're going to have to stand up for yourself. Mike check, one, two. <laughs> I'm Barry, a full lance, uh, full-time engineer and do a bunch of stuff on the side. And over the years, I've get burned. And, you know, you learn how to navigate through L.A. and, I don't know, any city pretty much with doing independent contract work. When you start taking on bigger projects and stuff, how often do you find yourself still requiring them to put down like a 50% down payment? Especially like if you're working on something where it's like, okay, they they have like a 90 minute uh, independent film and they want it in a month, but I work full time, but I got a bunch of badasses I work with and we could do it, but I gotta pay these dudes out of pocket, so. And I can't fund, <laughs> yeah. you yeah. know, like paying these guys yeah. out of my own bank. So how often do you guys run into that situation? I think if you can get 50% up front, that's great, right? That's At least you're minimizing the risk. But, um, you know, for a lot of our clients, A, there's relationships with the, you know, the post supervisors or whoever that we've got longstanding relationships. We usually feel pretty confident. Um, a lot of networks are obviously tied to this stuff. And, um so, you, you know, there's usually that budget's already there for them. So um, the independent stuff gets a little scary, right? Because you don't know. We've, we've sat in that. The it's worst. The, the never-ending indie film, right? I think we all know about those. Uh, <laughs> what do we call it? Demoitis? Yeah, demoitis, right? Yeah. yeah. They uh, just like, it's like somebody getting married to a LUT on the picture. Yeah, You're like, no, thing, yeah. no, that's not the right color. Um, but yeah, I, I think really the best protection is fifty percent up front if you can. Um, that it, you know, I advise. From a a safety position, though, I highly recommend that you have a business loan so you can bridge the gap if you need to. Like our talent, when they're requiring to get paid within a certain amount of time, I don't want to leave their invoices on my desk waiting and waiting, right? If I know that this client's always 30 days late, I will tell them up front, you're going to get your check in 90 days so that they're not anticipating getting their check at the end as soon as it passes QC, you know? So it's, it's, it's ebb and flows. What is the relationship you have with the client? Do they typically pay on time? Are they always overdue? If it's a new client and it's indie, get 50 percent up front yeah. well <laughs> that and try and invoice frequently if you you know if it's episodic like try and you know once it passes qc on each episode you're invoicing so that way you keep that ball rolling right because mm-hmm. that is you know it's, it's a cash flow thing right so you got to keep on top of that and get those checks in about contracts I've, I've been doing this independently for 25 30 years i don't think i've had a written contract for at least 25 of those years <laughs> Do you work in contracts or are your relationships just comfortable? To be perfectly honest, we haven't either. Okay. They send us either a budget and we send a bid that reflects that. Um, or we just bid outright. And if we win the project, which that's really what it is, it's an auction amongst facilities. Um, and if we win, then they know based on what that bid says at the bottom that payment is due in 30 days of invoice. Um, But now that we're running into these issues of people paying really late, large amounts of money, I have hired an accountant that is drafting up some sort of contract. And it's I think it's only fair to do so, especially I mean, if you're doing an indie feature and it's a couple G's for a couple days of work. I mean, let's not you know what I mean? Let's not freak out about that. But if it's a large scale project and it's a fair amount of money that somebody's salary for the year, then, yeah, you need to do that. You have to protect yourself. And it's only fair if they're asking me to sign an NDA, then I'm asking you to sign that you promised to pay me. <laughs> hey, guys, how's it going? Uh, thanks Hi. for being here. Um, I just have a question because, Alex, you're kind of like, you know, freelancer independent by yourself and you guys have created, you know, your own company, essentially. Um, I'm kind of curious as to, like, uh, would you, 
the transition between, you know, an independent mixer and starting your own facility and like going a bit bigger, even a boutique is like, okay, now I'm not just competing for the mixer job. I'm like bidding on the entire project and getting this. And obviously LA has a plethora of, I mean, talent going for projects and also companies trying to outbid each other and get projects. Like how do you navigate that ground and decide like um, you want to, I don't know, like your stories essentially why instead of like staying independent by yourself as a mixer you wanted to like have the company and how does that you know work out is that for me uh, no i mean honestly I it sounded like it was almost for you but it's for you <laughs> because when they were building their studio we would talk it's a facility and, and the, the facility <laughs> we would have the funniest conversations she'd just be like davy i'm so sick of looking at paint because this is part of it, right? From being independent mixer. And now it's, what kind of coffee machine are we going to have? Well, it's a lot. And it's a lot more than that. It's the books. It's the people. It's the, te- it's the clients. It's the follow-ups. It's the billing. Like, I mean, it's a lot. A lot goes into it. So there's risk versus reward. There's how much blood, sweat, and tears you're willing to put in. Um, luckily I married an audio guy who's also really into being a businessman. Like he like is into it. So he draws passion from that. So it's not just the projects and doing the audio and all of that. So if you just want to do audio and that is your biggest passion, just stick with that. Like don't make a big business out of it. Um, but on the business perspective, it's really exciting. We are in an exciting time right now. Uh, RAR is trying to do something different where we're offering the beginning to end finishing, where you are dumping your media with me. We are going to you know, store it for offline, transcode, archive it, and then we're going to have all your remote machines for your remote editors. Like, and then, And then when you're ready, we're here for finishing too. So if you're into that, then that's where you're going to draw your excitement from. But if you are strictly talent, and that's that's your passion, then I, I don't recommend opening a facility. It's a pain in the ass. <laughs> that was her being nice. I've heard her say so much worse about this process. It's true. I can add to, um, I mixed a film called Everything Everywhere All at Once with a company. I actually got hired by the company. It's, it's a small privately owned company called Unbridled Sound, which is owned by a sound supervisor slash mixer. And he... Had, you know, his workflow was totally different than what our normal workflow is like within the studio system. So it was really kind of interesting to peek under his hood because he has a whole team of mixers who do, do pre-dubs and then they work on shifts and they'll stay with the, you know, the directors were like all nighters. <laughs> so they'd stay overnight and, and do sound design with them. And so by the time we finaled, I got hired to do the final and we did that at Signature Post, which is, um, you know, a, a really nice room. And so I got to take their mix into, you know, a facility that was more of what I was used to and um, and finish it there. But it was really nice to see how he does his business where not everybody is union. He, he takes both non-union and union projects. So he does have, you know, health insurance and, and stuff for his employees. And there's different tiers of employees within his company and there's smaller stages. And it was more of a, it was an eye opener because I think that that's going to be more prevalent in the future. I just wanted to say thank you everyone for coming in. This has been really great. Great questions. Thank you everyone for being here. Alex, Jeff, Alicia, This has been great, and it's wonderful seeing everyone in person. Thanks. Have a great rest of the day.